Well, hi everyone. It's lovely to have everyone here today. We are here with Melissa Eaton joining us. She is the author of Reimagining the Science Lab Notebooks. And we're really happy to have her today to learn um, about how she uses book creator in her classroom as a way to promote student growth and also as a way um, as a means for authentic assessment as well. So we are going to be doing an approach today um, almost as an interviewing approach. I'm going to be asking Melissa several questions um, and she's going to be showing us some examples through um, using the book that she has actually written using Book Creator. She has a lot of different pictures um, and examples from her students that we're gonna dive into to really show how she actually uses Book Creator um, for lab notebooks in her um, classroom today. So she has a ton of ideas that we're going to really get to um, grasp all of her knowledge. Um, we are live on YouTube. So like I said earlier, if you have colleagues that weren't able to attend today, um, you can give them that link. It was just gonna be on our YouTube channel. We won't be sending it, but you can just hop on our YouTube channel. I'll have Siobhan um, throw that in the chat. You can send that link um, to um, your colleagues later on after this is done. Um, we do have some colleagues in the chat. I have my colleague, John. I'm sure all of you know John Smith. Um, and we have um, my colleague, Sh Siobhan Duckworth. She's going to be in the chat as well to answer any questions you have as we're going through. There's going to be a little section at the end for some Q&A time. So please, please, please put some questions in the chat you have. Um, at the end, we're going to be taking some of those questions and actually I'm um, getting to ask Melissa those questions that you might have. So um, throw those in the chat and Siobhan's going to be taking a few of those at the end and actually asking Melissa those, okay? So without further ado, let me actually share my screen so we can get to some introductions because we want to hear from Melissa. Oh, you know what, John, do you mind um, allowing me to share my screen? Thank there you. you so Just not your co-host. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> oh, you are totally fine. Melissa, will you be sharing your screen as well? Um. I was told not to at this point, but I always could if I need to. I have, I think I have it queued up in my other window. I, okay. I think I think she should be good, but we um we can um, sounds good. Yeah, I think we should be good to go. All right, so let me this over. All right, so introductions. My name is Catherine Capiello, and I am one of the teacher success managers here at Book Creator. I am located out in Chicago, where it is very warm today. Um, I am Book Creator Cat on Twitter, so I'll have John or Siobhan throw our Twitter handles um, in the chat if you would like to give us a follow. We are releasing some awesome new updates soon, so if you are on Twitter, it's the easiest way to keep um, in the know of all the updates, um, so feel free to follow us on Twitter. And then I'll pass this over to you, Melissa. Okay, so my name is Melissa Eaton. Um, I've been teaching 22 years. Um, started out as a classroom teacher, uh, sixth grade, then fourth grade, then third grade. Um, and I think my current position, I'm an English learner teacher. It, it, some places it's known as ESL. I teach kids who are learning English from all over the world. And I love my school in Naperville because it's like the United Nations in there. I can have students from five different continents all in my classroom at the same time. And I often learn more from them than I think they learn from me, at least in my opinion. Um, and I'm also, I've been doing the adjunct instructor gigs for uh, several universities and colleges um, in the area over the last 12 years. Um, got into science education uh, when I was put on the committee to learn about the next gen science standards and um, realized it was the best way to reach my English learners. And it motivated all of my students when I used that kind of inductive learning. You can see my classroom in the background there. Um, I, you might notice I have a little problem with plants. You know, you get one and then they reproduce and then pretty soon you've got 105. I love how you added the classroom too. I was looking at that earlier today and I was thinking how engaging your classroom must be too, because I can see the computers with Book Creator on there. And then I also saw the science goggles and the notebooks and all the plants. I, yeah, it just looks like you have such an engaging classroom. 
Well, that was open house a little bit ago, and that was before I got, I don't know if you can see in the background, my uh, lady lizard, my leopard gecko, um, oh. the latest addition to my classroom. Um, I just started putting pictures of my classroom everywhere during the pandemic because I wanted the students that I already knew to feel like they were like at home. And so I'd put that in the background of all of the different things we were doing. That's awesome. All right. Well, just for a quick agenda today, we are going to go through just to hear from Melissa about why Book Creator. So why is she chose Book Creator to create these science lab notebooks in her classroom? We're going to talk a little bit and hear from her about performance based assessment, um, listen to what her favorite Book Creator features are um, and why she chose Book Creator for that. Um, learn about differentiation and how she was able to differentiate for all of her students, um, learning about how she's able to support all the ELA objectives, and especially for her EL learners. We're gonna look at different types of templates that you can create within Book Creator and that she was able to create for her learners. Um, and we're gonna talk about how she was able to provide teacher feedback to all of her students. And like I said before, we're gonna end with that Q&A time where you're actually going to be able to ask those live questions for Melissa too. Let's dive in and get started. So, Melissa, why Book Creator? Why did you select Book Creator? I know there's so many other um, platforms out there, but when you chose to um, create those science lab notebooks for your classroom, why did you specifically choose Book Creator? Because my students, so we're all encouraged with the new way of learning science. It's about inductive learning. You're not just telling what you know about science. That's how science used to be taught. Now it's, you have to prove the science you can do. And that's very difficult to do when you have students who maybe struggle with reading and writing or already don't like reading and writing, but they might like science. But if you focus on just only reading and writing in science and you don't have them do any of it, they're never gonna like it. Um, so I started using Book Creator because I loved how you could integrate the videos and the pictures. And what my students would do, my, my job is to teach listening, speaking, reading, and writing. I do that at sixth grade levels all day long, um, all levels of, of English learning, and it's um, quite fun. But I can teach using anything. And I started using the science standards a little here and there. And then when I realized I could use Book Creator and get them to do something and then write about it, do something and then write about it, Book Creator is the perfect way to do that. Because in Book Creator, they, don't, they can't pull this little thing where they go, Oh, but Mrs. Eaton, I forgot what happened. I'd be like, no problem, sweetheart. Watch the video. Look at the picture. And they take their own pictures and they add their own things into it. And that gets the engagement, that gets them reading and writing. And also uh, for my English learners, they have to take a test in Illinois called the access test to track their progress in English. I noticed that um, the students that I had used Book Creator with, because I didn't start out using it with all the grades, they did much higher on the speaking test where they have to record themselves speaking. And that's because I required them to make voice recordings for all of their notebook entries. So I use it because it works for my students. It results in higher test scores, but that's the boring reason. Um, the exciting reason is because it makes the students love learning. That's awesome that it really contributed to the test. I know I hate take, talking about testing, but it's awesome that it also contributed to that. And the students aren't even knowing that they're practicing for that too. Mm -hmm. Great. And then how does Book Creator serve as a performance-based assessment? I'm gonna transition over to your book now too, um, so we can look at some of your pages in there as well. Um, and I'll click all, um, let me know if you want me to point to anything too. <laughs> okay, great. So what we have to do with the new way that science is taught is we can't just give students some multiple choice test and test their knowledge, right? A lot of us were taught this way. Maybe, for example, I, maybe I had to pass in the fourth grade a test on how a circuit works, how electricity works. Um, but I'll tell you that as an adult, even as a, an adult with a master's degree, I would go to teach stuff like this. And if I hadn't taught it recently or at all, I'd be like, um, how does this circuit work? What that means is I had spouted the information back, gotten a good grade on the test and not really understood it. Um, these Next-gen science standards require students to demonstrate not just the stuff they know, but how to be a scientist, how to be an engineer, how to do science. And tracking that with a test is not an effective strategy, um, especially if that's the only strategy that's used. There, there are assessments that are paper-based or computer-based that are tests, but all of the research shows that science notebooks are the way to go. And that's because students track their own learning. Um, one of the, my favorite ways to assess is with an I used to 
think, but now I know because. So it's a sentence frame. I used to think blank, but now I know blank because blank. It's a variation on the kind of writing we have to do in an English class where we're like, you know, claim evidence reasoning. But with the science, it shows how their thinking changed. So it doesn't matter that students think the moon cannot come out during the daytime when the unit starts, but you have to have a record of that so that you know that that's what they used to think. And then you give them experiences and experiments that they can do. And when you go to assess, you ask them to tell you, well, you used to think this, what do you think now? And tell me why. And you leave it open-ended. Um, the other thing I like about this kind of performance-based assessment with book creator is that there's not just one way for the students to show you what they know. These notebooks are more like what real scientists use. They're not formulaic, like the lab report some of us might remember from middle school and high school. It's not like, oh, well, here's the hypothesis and here's the materials and here's this experiment. And if you do the experiment, you get the wrong results. You did it wrong. Scientists don't do experiments where there's a predetermined outcome. That would be a waste of their time. Scientists do experiments when they don't know what's going to happen. And if it doesn't work, which most of the time it doesn't, then they repeat the experiment. So it's more like a circle than a linear experience. So being a scientist and using these notebooks, the best way to assess that is with something that is a fluid document like these notebooks. Um, I've also found that for my kids, when I go to do things like parent conferences, or um, if we go into RTI, like our problem solving for students who are struggling, I can use this to track student progress. And sometimes it shows progress in ways that tests and assessments in other ways don't especially for things like, oh, I don't know that my student is learning you know, very much English. And I'd be like, oh, well, let's listen to a one minute speaking sample from September and one from May. And you tell me what progress they've made. It's proof. Absolutely. Let's dive into some of those features too that can show what they know as well. And you can explain kind of what are some of those new favorite features. So what you see here is the students covers. I require that they have their name on here. I also require that they have their face on here. It's one of the ways I learn names and faces at the beginning of the year. Um, I have students' faces covered right. for privacy <laughs> here, but they're not like normally. And I do require that the students all wear science goggles on the covers of their science notebooks. Why? Well, you no, 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 no. We are not just doing science. We are scientists. We are all scientists and that's how we're gonna act. And when the students see themselves as scientists, they do a better job. Um, I let them express their individuality on these covers any way they want. And some of the features they love to use are, you can see like the little unicorn emojis. Um, they can draw things on themselves. I had one kid who would put a different hat on himself every single day. And I was like, sweetheart, you are doing all the work for my class and you're working really hard. And if you want to put a different hat on, you go for it. Um, because of that, they have more ownership of their work. When students have more ownership of their work, they'll work a lot harder for you. Um, and what starts out as like kind of like extrinsic, oh good, you can play, turns into intrinsic motivation once they get excited about what they're doing. And then they like to learn and they don't just do it because, oh good, I get to do stickers at the end. They might learn something because they like the learning and they realize, oh, I can do this. Absolutely. Let's go on to the next page too. Mm -hmm. If I can click over here. Oh, went too far. Sorry. We don't want to go to the magic pen just yet. There we go. <laughs> okay, so I said that I had chosen to use Book Creator because of the videos and because of the images. And that really is the key. Um, but I'm going to tell you a secret. I am notoriously horrible at keeping track of paper. I lose important, like, like paper, student papers, like, oh, I need to grade these. And then I will not be able to find them. Or they're on my desk somewhere. I will find them someday. So what I started doing is just as the students do something, I'll take a picture of it. And that way we've got a record in their notebook of their progress, even if I do have to use the paper. Um, so it, it serves that purpose, but also I can have the students answer me or do, do an activity in multiple ways. They can handwrite things, especially my younger students, because kids need to write on pencil and paper, but some of them don't like to do that. So they can write with their finger on the screen. Um, during the pandemic, I started doing a lot. What a lot of the teachers would do is we would tilt our have the students tilt their computers down so we could see their hands. But it's really hard to look at the way students are doing letter formation upside down and backwards through a computer screen. Um, try teaching 27 kindergartners on Zoom every day for a solid year. It was tricky. Um, when I could have them write on the screen, I could look at their letter formation more carefully. They could take photographs and put that up. Um, 
the way that they can take these video and then the pictures, both of their work and of the actual experiment they did, it makes the whole picture, the whole sum of what they did complete. You might look at what this student wrote and you'd be like, oh, they kind of get it or they understand this, but maybe not this. But then there's a video where the student explains what they designed and how it worked. Um, these were kindergarten and first grade students who were designing, it was a first engineering project. I made them come up with a design to make an ice cube melt something more slowly. And they could use anything they wanted off this big table in my room and oh, do they make a mess, but it was fun. Um, and they learned about the engineering process, how the first thing you try doesn't work, you have to try something else and then you have to try something else. Um, and how do you measure your own success? But the video and the images are absolutely critical to that. I didn't talk about the templates on here, but sometimes I use templates too, or I'll shoot out a template to every single student. And then they just have to click on the box and add it. That's really helpful for the younger students as they're learning the features of Book Creator. Ah, the magic pen. I have students who, if I'm not careful, they will pull up that magic pen and they wanna put the magic pen on everything. So I'll say, okay, after you do this, then you get to magic pen and they're like, all right, I'm gonna work really hard so I can use that magic pen. Um, when we talk about science and the way that it is taught nowadays, whether your state is using the next gen science standards or they've devised their own standards, a lot of times they're based on the same work that the next gen standards are on. And that means that one of the ways students can prove what they know is with something called a model. And you might think of a model as like, oh, it's a diorama or it's something styrofoam balls with the, the solar system. That's not what they mean by models. A model is a way of representing what you understand about something. And it could be a physical like 3D model that maybe you take a picture or video of. We do that. It could be a picture that you draw to show that understanding. It could be something that you demonstrate. It's something that represents something else. But if you're doing modeling with your students and everyone in your class, their models all look the same, you're not doing it right. Um, the students should have their own they're explaining their conceptual understandings in a way that makes sense to them. Elementary school students often don't do very well with abstract thinking. I believe they start to get abstract thinking somewhere between the ages of eight and 12, but it's different for every kid. So if you have a hard time thinking abstractly and all of a sudden you get asked all of these very abstract questions on some test, even if you understand the concept, you might not get the question right. But if you draw a picture of how the circuit works and then you explain it using the little arrows to show how it works, it, it isn't as important how you do on a multiple choice test. The teacher knows that student understands how circuits work. So the magic pen allows the students to do that modeling. It allows them to circle things and highlight them and actually sketch things with their finger. Um, and I tend to use anything under that little icon of the pen. I call it the magic pen. I don't know if I'm overgeneralizing that term or not. And if we have time at the end too, we can show some of these features as well. Um, I know some people are asking some questions about how to share a template and where to find these things. We, if we have some time at the end, we can um, share that. Absolutely. And I should add, um, I know what some of the teachers are thinking. I know what you're thinking because I was you when I started using uh, Book Creator, like with some of my younger students. I started with my fourth and fifth graders and kind of moved down. Um, and I really had never even tried it with kindergarten until the pandemic. But I will tell you that I taught two groups of kindergarteners, 27 in total. It was like a group of 13. And I taught them how to use Book Creator before any of them knew how to read through a screen for students I had never met in person. And by the end of the school year, um, you probably, within this book, I know you're seeing some of their examples embedded here. Um, and the icons and the way that Book Creator is designed to be so like intuitive, um, but first of all, they would just use the picture icons. And then after that, they knew the first letter. So they could say, oh, you know, look for the pen and the one that says P. They're like they were able to do that. And if I can teach a five-year-old who doesn't know how to read how to use Book Creator, all of us adults can do it. And you can teach any of your students how to use it. Um, same thing with my special education students, my students who speak no English. Um, all of them can use Book Creator. Mm -hmm. so. Completely agree. Sorry, just take a sex to load. Okay. Um, why don't we move on to um, well, do you want to touch upon templates real quick and then go back to differentiation? 
Okay. Let's now, see. templates are something that's a little more recent because it's a, it's a newer thing that you have when you yeah. have the upgraded package. What you can do is you can make a page um, that's a little bit like you go ahead and make the format the page for them. If you, especially if like you don't want them to worry about like, okay, what's my background going to be and how many squares will I decide on? You just want to send out the template, but it still lets the students have some choice. Um, on the left, you can see the template that I sent out about comparing insects. Um, it looks like a science lesson and it was kind of, um, but what I was really assessing in this assignment is the ability to write a comparison paragraph. Academic language is a funny thing. A lot of people think students are either good writers or not good writers. And what I tell them is no one is born knowing how to write, just like no one is born knowing how to walk. You wouldn't like tell that baby, you know, oh, hey, you know, you're not a good walker because you haven't learned yet. Um, and in the same way, if you're not a good writer, that's just because you haven't written a lot. Um, so I use something really motivating. We looked at, these are milkweed bugs that you see the, the picture next to the butterfly. Um, and they looked at them under digital microscopes and we talked about them and we made lists of their features and we did this whole thing in class. Then I didn't have any other insects. It's really hard to catch insects. Milkweed bugs are easy to catch, but I wanted them to compare to another insect. So I was able to use one of the really cool new features, the 3D models. I love the 3D models. Any, any way you could click on any, any one of them so you can see what they do, because those are so fun. So they compared the insect they'd seen live in person under the digital microscopes with the 3D model. Come on. There we go. Sorry, I was taking a second to load. The students used the 3D model to compare it to the insect they'd seen in person. So we know that for all students, English learners especially, but really for all students, it's best to have the actual thing. If you're gonna teach students about an insect, don't give them a picture of an insect or drawing of an insect. No, 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 give them the real insect. But if you can't do that, or if you're a little queasy about insects, you can use these 3D models to serve the exact same purchase, per, uh, purpose. And the Sketchfab 3D models are pretty awesome. The kids can turn them and manipulate them and see all the different features on there. Um, and my students got super excited. It also allowed me to have an element of choice with the 3D models because I picked up several of them that they could compare to the milkweed bug. They got to pick which one they used and all they had to do was drag it over. Um, let's see, it's, it, that one okay, still doesn't want to load today. It looks like I know, an, I'm like, ah. I think. that's okay. We can look at it later. Um, but my students get so excited when we get to use a 3D model and I wanted them to be able to pick. I noticed that their work is much more rich when students have choice and the templates allow me to give the students some choice, but I don't get things like some random cartoon bug. Like as if I just opened it up to anything, I give them some choices, but I make sure that they're realistic images of bug. How do you uh, drop a template into the, the um, journals? I think that's gonna come up in the Q and A, we'll show you. It takes like three seconds, it's so easy. Um, so I have these boxes ready as you can see on the left. And then what I did is I put sentence frames for the comparing of sentences. And the students had all these experiences we had had with the milkweed bugs, and then they used the 3D model and they framed it out. They used the sentence frames. They had two levels. One was a little easier, one was more difficult, and the students know which color they're supposed to be using. Um, I use sentence frames actually with all of my students, even the highest writers, because the highest writers, I just, if there are fifth graders that are writing like middle school students, I give them sentence frames I'd use with high school students. I try to take their writing to the next level. A lot of times, if you haven't read a lot of books at a high level, you won't know how to write complex sentences. And we don't really write like we speak in front when we're talking about academic language. So students need a lot of practice with that. And the motivation for that writing practice was, look, we're looking at live bugs under the microscope. Like we started out with something so engaging and so fun that the kids wanted to talk about it. And then we talked about it. And then we looked at how paragraphs work. And then we went into you know, the 3D models, which they loved and were super engaged by. And then when I asked them to write a comparison paragraph, they didn't think of it as, oh, fine, I'm gonna write my paragraph. They were excited to share what they knew. It got them enthused about expository writing. And that's honestly, these are expository writing paragraphs. These are paragraphs where students are telling what they know. It's the kind of thing where if I asked them to write a comparison paragraph and just handed them a piece of paper, some of them would do it, some of them wouldn't, but here they really try their best because they are super motivated. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what we've got here. Um, this, the built-in scaffolds are also, the scaffolds 
help the students succeed, but the students don't need to use them if they don't need them. Um, and I really like that model of differentiation. I'm not sure if that was the last page or the one might be skipping around a little bit here. Do you um, do you color code your scaffolds too for specific? When we're talking about sentence stems and frames, I do. Um, you do? And then sometimes I'll have two, sometimes I'll have three. And mm -hmm. then if I give the students, sometimes I will give the students, like I'll print them out and give them to them on paper. Okay. Um, a lot of times the students have it on their own Chromebook. So they can look up at my board and see this, but yeah. you're like, oh, the text is small. They can also see it on their own computer. Oh, okay. um, and then if I, some of them do it on paper and some of them have like two windows and they click back and forth. But on the template, what's really cool is they can see it right there in the margin. Um, yeah. That's the, the awesome part about the templates back to differentiation awesome okay yeah yeah how do you differentiate for all your students i know you kind of touched upon a little bit of that but um yeah that's actually one of my favorite features with book creator um so i've been in english i've been teaching english learners my entire career um first as a classroom teacher and now yes i've been a specialist since 2007 i believe so kind of a long time and anything where i can allow my students to show what they know in a variety of ways i'm on board with and the reason Book Creator is super for that is, let's say I have a student who has ADHD and needs to hear the directions five times, okay? We all have students like that, okay? We all have them. And it's really hard to keep the uh, mild irritation out of your voice when you've already given the directions and someone goes, wait, what are we supposed to do? And now here's the thing, I have a lot of empathy for those students. Some of them really were just messing around looking out the window, but sometimes students need to hear directions a couple of times before they resonate. I can record what they're supposed to do in a book that I have that sometimes that I'll project and the students can see, and then they can click on that and listen to the directions four or five times. And because I've pre-recorded them, or I can, they can use read to me mode, never once do does my voice ever sound irritated <laughs> for reading it. Right. Yeah, and, and so I found that to be super helpful, especially during the pandemic, because um, internet connections would go in and out and the students would be like, wait, I missed what we're supposed to do for this problem. And I'd be like, no problem, sweetie, just click on the speaker button. It'll tell you again. Yeah. Um, that was, was one of the modes of differentiation. The other is where they can use the voice typing. And I have heard from teachers, oh, well, that's kind of like cheating, or you're going to make it where they don't want to write with paper and pencil or typing. I would beg to differ. This is the way that I got my kindergartners and my new English speakers who, when you learn to speak English, usually you learn to speak some of it first before you can read and write it. Um, the students who could say some things in English but could write nothing yet, they could write all of a sudden. And my students who didn't read or write at all would voice type and it would force them to like enunciate and speak clearly, but it, they would see the words appear as they said them. And some of my students, their parents reported to me, because a lot of this was on Zoom, that this is how their kids were learning how to read. They would say, I saw a bug and it was dead. And they saw those words appear as they said them. And for my very young students, my five to seven year olds, it would connect in their brain. Oh, so everything I say connects to a word on the screen. And then I had students figure out, they're smarter than me. I hadn't figured out in the beginning, and but they did, that, wait, I don't know how to spell a word. I don't have to raise my hand and say, how do I spell insect? I can press the speaker button and go, insect. And it'll type it on the screen and tell me how to spell it. Oh, that was wonderful. Um, the differentiation is based on that universal design for learning. Um, besides being an English learner specialist, I'm also, I've taken all the courses for LBS1 certification, which is basically special education for learning disabilities and such. Um, but then right before the pandemic, I took all of the classes to be an instructional technology specialist. So then the pandemic hit and a lot of teachers were like, oh, what do I do? And I was like, I'm so glad I took all those classes on flipped learning and learned about all these wonderful programs like book creator, um, because they enabled me to differentiate for all of my students. All of my students could do some of this. Maybe some of them only understood pieces of it and needed lots of this translated. Well, book creator translates really easily. And um, some of them can even have the menus translated by um, like loading up Google Chrome is what we use in um, their own language. Then they could draw me a picture and maybe they could only tell me certain words. Um, if you see the picture of the little bug that one of my students drew, um, that was a Spanish speaker who I said, nope, you know, I translated this with a translator. I said, draw me a picture of the bug and then write the parts you know in your language. 
then all we had to do is transfer that into English. So then we learned the like the translation. And in this case, uh, I believe uh, with antenna, it's a cognate, a word that's nearly identical in both languages. But the students then learn, oh, they're not having to learn the concept of an antenna over and over again. They're just learning the word for it in English. But they can write off the bat, the first day in the country, show me what they know. And the other kids get to see how smart they are, even if they don't have a lot of words in English. And this is the part they loved. The other kids get to learn how to say those words in mm-hmm. other languages, which is really cool to That's see. Cool. That, like I'll have all of the students in seven different languages teach me how to say antenna or insect in Arabic, in Urdu, in Spanish. It, it, it's, it's amazing to see all of the different ways that you say it and the students get super excited. They're teaching each other. Mm-hmm. And, and the idea behind universal design for learning is that all of these things are embedded within this program. They're there if the students need them. Mm-hmm. But it's not like, oh, well, honey, you need more help. So here's something special just for you. No, it's there for everybody. Yeah, exactly. Everyone can use it if they need it. No one feels different. No one feels singled out. Anybody can listen to the directions twice. That's what I like about it. I don't want my students to ever feel like they're less than. But yeah, if a student needs everyone. something, yes. And if a student needs to hear the directions twice, because maybe they blanked for a second. I mean, we've all done that. It doesn't matter if they have like <laughs> some kind of IEP that says they need, I need to repeat it twice. You need it? Repeat it twice. Go ahead. We all have those days and they don't have to feel embarrassed about that. And I, that's one of the things I like the best about Book Creator is that those differentiation pieces that are built in, that are intuitive, that all of my students learn how to use from day one. And then how do you, how do you normally provide feedback for students? Ah, I think there's a page on that with some examples that might help us. Um, let's see, is it going now? I think yeah. it's... Ah, pumpkins on the top. Okay. Um, So there's a couple of ways I do that. When you're looking at book creator and for my older students, a lot of times I would write comments in the margins and we've all written comments on the sides of papers, right? You know, great job, you know, cool work or whatever. Um, And I found years ago that when you're talking about improving something like writing or language, those kinds of general feedback, they don't improve writing at all. They make a student feel good if they did good and bad if they did bad. What I do for writing is I have a completely different philosophy. If I look at a writing sample from a student, I have some goals. I want to say at least one thing that I really like that I can see they did well and I'm impressed by. Then I try to think of um, something that they're like working towards or that I'd like them to focus on. Um, And I keep it simple, but I am as detailed as possible. So they know that comment was meant for them. You know, I might say something like, I really love, and, and the one you see here with the pumpkins, this was on uh, Zoom. Cool. Yeah, I was co-teaching with a friend of mine and um, she had pumpkins from the farm, all different sizes. And the kids were making predictions about what would happen when she threw them in her actual bathtub. They're like <laughs> cheering and like thumbs up and thumbs up. It was so much fun. Anyway, I might say for this student's writing sample, I might've said something like, I love the way you used your kindergarten spelling to write the word many. You knew all the sounds and I know exactly what you meant. That is what good writers do in kindergarten. But then I might say, what I'd like you to work on when you do more writing is I'd like you to see if you can do a sentence that doesn't start just with I saw. I can't wait to see what you'll write next. But because my writing like my comments are specific to that student, the students really took that to heart. Um, This was especially important during the pandemic where I felt like a lot of the students didn't always feel that personal connection to the teacher because everything was whole group and it was a lot harder. I would give these personalized like, like back, and I started doing, yeah, the little spoken ones. Those are cute, teach. yeah. And they, I had parents more than one tell me that some of these kids, they would listen to me talking to them over and over and over again. And I, I can remember when I was a student, maybe maybe second or third grade, where I, I really needed that kind of like someone to tell me I was doing okay, where I had a teacher who would write post-it notes and stick them in our desk to tell yeah, us when we did something good. Yeah. And I was one of the kids who would save every single one of those post-it notes. And when I was having a hard day, I'd read them. And I noticed how much it meant to the students, but it's not just that it meant a lot. It really improved their writing because mm-hmm. I took the time to do that. It was personalized to them. And the students actually listen to me. If I take a paper and I mark it all up with all the things they did wrong, they just think, oh, I'm a bad writer and they don't want to try. But if I start out telling them what I really like from what I've seen and then telling them just one thing to work on, but I do that a lot 
often, that's when you see huge gains in writing. And that's what I see, yes, on the tests, but in these performance-based assessments in their writing here, they start out needing sentence frames. They start out needing voice typing. They start out only writing a sentence or two, and then pretty soon they're writing more in volume. And how do you become a better writer? You write a lot. You have to write a lot. You have to write every day. You have to write more and more and more and more and more. And if you hate writing, you don't want to do that. Yeah. Oh, that's great advice. I like that a lot. I love how you, yeah, you made it really personalized too. And I like the voice um, feedback, how like it just is quick, you know, you can really attack all the students that way too. That's the other thing that I found. If I'm having to go through a stack of papers and like handwrite comments and try to make it personal, it takes a while. And then like, oh, I lost my pen. It, it just, this was quick. I could do it in a couple of seconds and I could make it my goal. I think my goal was um, during the 21, uh, the 2021 school year um, was once a week to give some kind of personalized feedback to every one of my students. And even if it was only once a week, sometimes I do it live too, but they would get that personalized feedback once a week. And then that led me to look through what that student had been doing. Because before I left the comment, I would look to see, and it was like, oh, I love it. Last time I asked you to see if you could start sentences with different words and look at these two sentences you add, you're a superstar here's what I see that I like. And here's one more thing to work on. And I noticed that that growth really, it really did make a difference in their writing. And also the, the science concepts kind of just happened through that experiential learning. Um, what I like that this student did is you can see those pumpkins floating and you can see like the angles of, of how they are. Um, the student could see in my notebook, by the way, like they, we did this live, but I also took photographs and screenshots during this. And I have a teacher notebook that they could also refer back to anytime they wanted, um, like in read mode where they could see the, the videos of it happening and watch mm -hmm. it again and again and again, which is another feature of Book Creator that's super important for my students. You'll do something awesome with them. They're engaged, but then when they go to write about it or tell you about it, they're like, I forgot. I forgot what to write. And you're like, oh, no problem. Just watch the video again. And they're like, oh, for the kids who are using it as an excuse, they have no excuse. And for the kids who genuinely forgot, they can watch it as many times as they need to. Yeah. And, and they find from a scientific lens, they notice things I would never have noticed at that age. Kids today are super smart. They'll be like, oh, I noticed that the stem on this one keeps going under the water first, but on this one, the stem of the water. I'm like, they're like, why do you think that would happen? I'm like, I have no idea. That's a great no idea. question. I don't know. And then the other kids would be like, oh, well, I think this pumpkin probably has more seeds on this side than that side. And I'm like, how can we find that out? And one of the kids is like, cut it open. I'm like, okay. And my, I have my friend with the bats. And I'm like, all right, go get a knife. Let's cut the pumpkins open. <laughs> um, and that kind of like deep learning, that kind of intrinsic, I want to know what happened. I want to know what happens next. Kids forget that they're learning. And the, the things that they're doing to create Book Creator, I mean, I actually had students where um, their parents had to, you know, had to let me know. I have to tell them that they can't go back and work on your homework until they do the other one because they'll spend hours on it because they want to, not, not because they have to, but because they want to go ahead and add things in and draw and use the magic pen. It really is magic. Yeah, it's engaging. Well, this is so great, Melissa. I know we have um, a little over five minutes left. I know I want to get to some questions in our audience. Um, John and Siobhan, are, are there a few questions that you want to pull and um, have us ask Melissa? Yep. There was a question uh, from CD uh, recently about which model works best. And from my own personal experience, there is no direct answer for this. Um, whether it's everybody has their own book and then they do their journals that way or does everybody have a collaborative book based on a unit right and so i've done them both ways they both work um you know and so i think it's really personal preference but maybe melissa if you want to share um an answer for from your perspective which way works best maybe that would yeah, be yeah from, from my perspective i can tell you that um when you have, I, I like the students to all have their own books. Now, I, what I will often do, I do send out template pages some of the days. I don't always do it every day. Some days they get to design their own pages. Some days I give them a template. But um, I always have the, I call it the teacher book. It's my book. They go into my notebook and mine instead of, like this is what the students produce. My notebook tells them exactly what to do. It has the directions written out. 
and it recaps in case like they came in late or, you know, I had to go to the speech teacher and I just came back. What are we doing? They can see everything we're doing on the board, but they also will have two windows open and they'll look at my book and then they do it in their own book. I have tried a couple of times the collaboration and it works if I have two students working as a team. Um, it works with three, but if I try it with any more than that, what I um, notice happens is you get one student who's, because you can't just say, oh, you're able to collaborate on page three, but not on page five. They go and start deleting each other's work by accident or intentionally, usually not maliciously, usually just like, oh, look, I'm going to put a butterfly on his page. And then they go, and it's, it can become a mess really quickly. Um, but that's just my experience. I guess it depends on your students. Um, I do like the collaboration piece, and I have granted that in the case of um, when, oh, I built roller coasters out of PVC pipe liner and marbles with my fourth and fifth graders last year. And I did use the collaborate function because I wanted them to be able to copy the like the videos from one book to the other. Like they wanted one student to take the video, but then they both wanted it in their notebooks. And so I granted them collaboration rights and let them make the same, like they could make a page together and then put it out to each of their notebooks. Um, so the collaborate function is actually really useful in that context. Um, and anytime I'm having students, I, I've also done um, collaboration where students have different assigned roles for a project and like three or four of them, We'll be doing something, but each of them has a different job to make their their page. And yes, then we might collaborate in the same book. And I assign one book to do, and then at the end, I just copy that page into all of their science book notebooks, so they all get a copy of it at the end. And then also to answer your question about the privacy um, in your library, there is a setting icon. In the settings icon, you can turn it off or on if other students can see the notebooks or if you don't want them to see the notebooks. So you can make it private um, for the student to only see their own work or if you want the students to also see each other's work. Right, right. and when, when you do allow them to see each other's work, they only see it in read mode. They can't edit it unless you turn on collaboration. Um, I do tend to leave my students' notebooks visible, and here's why. My students who are struggling or who maybe are having a hard time, or I have kids who come in partway through the year, and they're like, they look at other students, and they're like, I don't know how to do that. Like, they're a little overwhelmed because these notebooks look pretty awesome. Um, I'll be like, oh, well, look at somebody else's. They're like, isn't that cheating? I'll be like, not in my class. It's not. If you look at their ideas and you get an inspiration, I tell them, you know, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. In science, what we're doing is we're looking at what previous scientists have done and we're building our understandings based on that. And that's what we do as a class. So I do leave mine visible. Um, but when I use uh, book creator for lots of other subject areas, I have absolutely turned that off because I don't want them to see. Um, and I sometimes turned it off if I'm using something for like a more formal assessment. But most of the time I leave it on because the kids really like to look at each other's work. They'll do that when they have free time. They'll be like, can I go look at everybody else's notebook? And I'll be like, sure. And then they, they see something and then they go and they make their own work better without me ever having, telling, having to tell them to do so. That's great. And Catherine, real quick, um, maybe, maybe we can take, take both of these at the same time. Um, can you show real quick where the 3D models um, are located for people who haven't seen those yet? And just as a quick reminder for everybody, uh, we do have uh, plenty of tutorials on our YouTube channel that show where all of these features are. So if you haven't seen those yet, definitely check out YouTube and, and look for some of those. Um, but Catherine, if you could show 3D models and if you could quickly show how to send a template to a student, uh, that would be fantastic. Yes, definitely. So um, to get to the, to the, um, to activate the 3D models, there are two areas, but I'm going to show you a quick way to do it. When you are inside a book right here from the teacher end, I'm just going to click on the plus sign right here and go to the rocket ship where it says more right here. This rocket ship where it says more, there's a button down here where it says add apps. I'm going to click on add apps and this is going to take us to the app store. And on the app store, this is where you can activate apps. Um, for your book creator experience. If you want to add the 3D models, you're going to notice the 3D models are down here. And John, is it the 3D models? Is it just for premium? Yes. Okay, so you do need to have um, the premium version to activate 3D models. If you do have the premium version, you will be able to activate it. To activate it, I'm just going to disable mine so I can show you it real quick. To activate it, 
you will need to um, have the premium version, first of all. And the second of all, you'll just click on this little plus sign right here. When you click on the plus sign, it will automatically um, enable it. Once you click on enable app right here, it will enable it automatically for you. As you can see here, it says enabled for me as the teacher. If you want to enable it for your students, just so you know, on the app privacy page, it is going to be for students that are 16 or older to use this. So just so you know that. Um, it can be for anyone in their books for them to, like I say, it's in a template book. They can use the 3D models if it's in a template book for any age, but for them to actually have it enabled on their book creator account, they have to be at least 16. Mm -hmm. um, when I enable this for my students, I can either press select all for all my libraries, or I could select a specific classroom. So maybe I only want it for my back to school class, I can select just that one library. If I just want it for me though, as a teacher, I just click enable for me, click done, and now it's enabled for my account. So that's when how I you do it if you wanna do templates, but you don't necessarily want the students to be able to get into all the 3D models, you just wanna be able to use it. And that's how I used it with that particular template. I had pre-chosen them um, for them. Uh, I'm, I'm just gonna jump in with a quick tip for when you're doing things like adding these things in. Um, Instead of teaching the whole class how to do this, um, my trick is that I find one or two students um, who are ready to like, you know, add something or enable something or go in and like use the magic pen and do a special feature or like auto draw to show them how to use auto draw. I don't teach the whole class. I um, I make it like a secret. I call up a student who's finished. And I'm like, I'm going to show you something. And then you can show any of the kids in the class who want to know. And then I make that student teach the other students. Um, it lets them practice their like explaining how to do things skills. Um, and it saves a ton of time because I, it, it's like when it's like a secret that I just taught one person, I do everybody suddenly wants to do it. And then their motivation to learn it is, is really, really high. And especially if you pick a student who maybe isn't your strongest academic student and you pick them and you show them how to do it and then they get to be the expert. Um, that is the biggest, like, like you're talking about social, socio-emotional learning. You're giving that student a chance to be the expert, to be the smart one. And if you have a student who doesn't feel smart and doesn't feel capable and you have them show everybody how to enable something or how to go in and use a magic pen or auto draw, suddenly they start to feel smart. And when students feel smart, they are smart. Yeah. And then you wouldn't be showing your students how to do that. That's just on the teacher end, just, just mm -hmm. to let you know how you activate on the teacher end. And then once it's enabled, you can click on the plus sign, then click on more. Mm -hmm. And then it's gonna be under the rocket ship under more. It will pop up for you as the teacher since I enabled it for me. Since I only enabled it for me, it will not be shown under the students. If you enabled it for your students, it would be enabled for your students. Then you just click on 3D models, you can search it, and then it will populate. Okay. I notice new ones keep appearing under there too. Like I had searched something that a couple of days later, I search it again and new stuff comes up. I'm like, wow, oh, that's awesome. Right. And then to share a template with a student, what you're going to be doing under um, a book right here, let's say I created this template, what they're going to need to do is they're going to need to join your library and then they're going to need to make a copy of your template. So you invite them to join your library, they join your library, then at the bottom of your template, let's say this is called, pretend this says template, then they click on these little books right here and they press copy book. Once well, that's you if you want copy, to copy the whole book. You can just copy a single page though. That's what I usually do. Yeah, I'm going to show them that next. Mm -hmm. So if this is your template, um, you're going to press copy book and they're going to copy that right into the same exact library right here. It's always going to be highlighted in blue. So mm -hmm. press copy book. And then it's going to say copy. Um, they're going to rename it, whatever you want them to rename it. So maybe this is going to say Catherine's science notebook and so forth. Okay. So that's one way you can do it. If they wanted to, if you had a whole template, you wanted them to copy. Now let's say um, they have copied this whole notebook. Maybe it's at the start of a unit. And maybe you want to now push out a new page into that specific notebook. This is how you would do that. So in this notebook right here, at the, I'm gonna click on the pages view. Mm -hmm. 
and maybe I have created a, um, a new page in that notebook that now I want to push out. I'm going to click on the select button and I'm going to press on that one page and I'm going to press copy to. When I press copy to, I'm going to go to that library or libraries. It could be multiple classrooms if I wanted to do that, but I'm going to go back to that library. And I'm going to click on um, all of my student books. I could have 30 students in that classroom. I could just click select all right up here, or I could select the specific students I want it to go into, which is great for like um, if you have an accessibility, like um, mm -hmm. maybe you have specific students you want to just throw in a page for them, you could do that, or you could do all students. I've done it where I make a template page that's like for everybody, but then for two or three students that need specific supports that the others don't, um, or on the other hand, like my students who are truly gifted and need something extra, I just tweak the page a little so it, like they, they won't even notice it's different than their neighbors. And then I just send, you know, like maybe I send page seven out to these three students and everybody else gets this page and you can select it. But it's like, I love how it's like three seconds and everybody just appears at the end of their book. One more trick that I, I mean, I use for my students to make it easier for me to grade and look at feedback is I make my, I make my students put things in backwards order. Um, because I'll tell you what, when the students have 60 page books and you're like, you want to see the thing that they just did and you go into their book and you have to go click, click. Click, 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 click. It can take forever. So I actually have my page, my students, when they add a page, drag it up to the beginning. Um, so, so it becomes page two. And we do our books in reverse order. Um, and yes, I had students, um, even kindergartners that had, like, I required, I think it was like 36 or 37 um, through the, the, the Zoom the year I was teaching on Zoom anyway. Um, but I had students who had 60, 70, 80 page books because they would be like, uh, I ran out of room. And I'm like, that's okay. Just copy the page and that, then you'll have more room to uh Add more details or more pictures or whatever you want. Yeah, so you're just going to press copy page and it's going to go to the back of the book. And now your students will see those um, at the back of the book. So you just have to train them to go to the back of the book. And then if you want them to maneuver it somewhere, they can maneuver it somewhere on that pages view. Mm -hmm. And they just drag it around. They can change the order of the pages anytime they want. That's a that's a super nice feature that I really like um, with Book Creator that they can change the order of the pages and duplicate them. All right. Anything else, John or Siobhan? I don't think so. I think that was no, I think that's it. it. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Melissa. It was wonderful having you and learning so much from you. Um, I'm sure everyone was very happy to have you as well. And we really, really, really appreciate your time. No problem. Thank you for inviting me to do this. I'm hoping to inspire others to make some science notebooks, um, do some science instead of just learning about it, but do some science and use performance-based assessment with Book Creator because it's absolutely perfect as a performance-based assessment. Awesome. Well, thank you. And like we said before, this is going to be recorded. It's on, or it has been recorded. It's on our YouTube channel. So we highly recommend checking that out if you need that as well. And I know um, we have sent some links in the chat. So make sure to snag those as well. Other than that, have a great rest of your afternoon or evening, wherever you are at. And